Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, event. My name is uh, Frank Duvel, senior researcher at uh, Osnabrück uh, University. And uh, this is uh, the FLBT on point event. Today, we will be talking about uh, Northern Syria, refugees and prospects of uh, return. A few words about the FFBT uh, project. This is funded by the Ministry for Education and Research in Germany, five years. It's meant to strengthen research in the field of forced migration and uh, refugee studies. It encourages networking within the country, but very strongly also the internationalization of forced migration uh, research. Another key aim is transfer, or in other words, uh, the research uh, policy dialogue. And this event is actually within the module of transfer. So we are aiming to go beyond the academic community, reach out and address uh, public and uh, policy. Therefore, we also record the first part, the presentations of the session, which will be made available online later. And another final element of FLBT is uh, improving and uh, strengthening teaching. Today, we are going to discuss with some experts in our FFBT network, a topic that is currently hotly disputed in Turkey. And this is the future of uh, not only, but mostly Syrian refugees in Turkey. And uh, the suggestion to facilitate return mostly to Northern Syria. And uh, we have two, three experts today in our event. First, we are going to have uh, Dr. Ibrahim Effe, Associate uh, Professor at uh, Kilis University and Director of Middle Eastern uh, Studies. He holds uh, an MA and a PhD from Lancaster University in the UK. And uh, he is an FFVT visitor, being with us in Osnabrück for a couple of days. I'm very thankful to have him here, which provided the opportunity to this uh, event. And then we have, within our project actually, Dr. Zeynep Jain Menchutek from the Bonn International Center for Conflict Studies, a big uh, she holds uh, a PhD from uh, Southern California University, was an assistant uh, professor in uh, Turkey. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, as a discussant, Dr. Sinem Ada from the Center for Applied uh, Turkey Studies at uh, the Berlin uh, the SVP this is a Foundation for uh, uh, Science and uh, Policy. Sorry, I'm ad hoc uh, translating uh, this. Who uh, gained her PhD from Brown University in the US? We are now moving to the first presentation. We keep them fairly uh, short and concise, 15 minutes plus uh, five minutes uh, a commentary, so that we have uh, ample time for discussing the matters at stake. And now I hand over to Dr. Ibrahim Effel to provide us with the first uh, input on uh, Syrian refugees in Turkey, Northern Syrian, and this is the Azaz uh, region. We will soon see some maps and the prospect of return. He has been in Northern Syria a couple of times, which very few people have, and uh, will provide us with uh, inside knowledge. 
So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dua. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you today. Thanks again for giving me this opportunity to share my opinion and research on the issue. Um, as the title, I will be talking about the Syrian refugees in Turkey, uh, particularly focusing on kids. Uh, and also in the second part of my presentation, I will be talking about the prospects of uh, return. Uh, can I have the mouse please to switch yes. these slides? Thank you. So I am coming from Kilis, uh, which is situated on the Syrian uh, Turkish border, very close to the Syrian Turkish border. As you can see here, uh, it is located in the southeast of Turkey, where the issue of migration is a very condensed topic, not only because of the ratio of refugees to the local population, but also because of the very location of uh, Kilis, uh, which was historically part of the Azaz region since the 16th century, uh, part of the Halep Vilaya, uh, and it became uh, a province only in the 1990s. So the population of the city is around 240,000 people, and the population of Syrians under temporary protection is slightly over 90,000. And the ratio of uh, temporary uh, persons uh, to the local population is around uh, 38%, uh, which, is, uh, which represents a slight decline from the previous year, uh, previous years, especially in 2016, when the ratio was around uh, 50%. And the numbers decreased, and this might be due to various reasons. Uh, because recently some Syrians had to return to their first registration city. So, okay, I will just uh, continue talking about Syrians in Kilis, then I can show you the map of Kilis again when it is on. Uh, Kilis is located on the southeast of Turkey. Uh, it's a very important city in terms of migration, as I have just told, not because of the ratio of the uh, refugee population, but because of its closeness to North Syria. And I have just mentioned uh, about the population ratios, and there was a decline in the number of Syrian refugees in years. And I will just explain this uh, from, from my observations. Not, it is not based on any empirical evidence. So the decline might be due to the fact that some Syrians had to go back uh, to their first reg registration city as part of the uh, presidency migration management uh, precautions to curb uh, movement of Syrians in the country. Uh, actually, some uh, 500,000 uh, Syrians returned back to Syria, as uh, Ismail Chataklı, the deputy interior ministry, uh, declared uh, last month. Uh, and we actually don't know how many Syrians went back to Aziz, to North Syria. So there's no uh, real data on that. Also, apart from this um, discrepancy, uh, I would say there, there are many advantages I can uh, speak about when it comes to Kilis, because the local government has economically benefited from the existence of Syrians. Syrians also contribute immensely and in various ways to the economy of the uh, city. Uh, and there is one fact that needs to be kept in mind when we talk about local governments and migrants in Turkey, because refugees are not counted when the new budget is allocated to each municipality by the state. So the gap is compensated, is made up uh, for uh, with the international and European funds. Also, the NGOs and charities, as we call them in Turkish, play a significant role in the response. Uh, to an extent, social acceptance has been relatively high in Kilis, uh, as in other parts of Turkey, but it is a bit higher in Kilis because of, you know, cultural and uh, similarities and, uh, you know, uh, deeper uh, relations between locals of Kilis and locals of uh, Aziz. However, due to deteriorating economic situation, uh, there is uh, decrease in the level of social acceptance, which uh, is called as um, fatigue of compassion. Uh, 
also uh, we also need to remind uh, the audience that there has been no significant violence or confrontation that has taken place in uh, Kilis, luckily. Uh, and also uh, speaking about the economic benefits uh, of Syrians to Kilis economy, the local uh, projects of the Kilis municipality is reported this year again as uh, every year and in 2021 only the Kilis municipality has received a great amount of uh, international funding coming basically uh, from uh, UNICEF uh, and German uh, GIZ also the Man Mannheim municipality built a big social uh, facility building for the municipality IOM, IO, uh, IOM also has a new office in Kilis right now. So they do lots of social work uh, and also they do some sort of legal uh, consultancy for the refugees. But uh, the money mostly that goes uh, to the municipality is spent for the infrastructure. Uh, so this is obviously one element that has benefited the economy of Kilis. And now, uh, please allow me to switch to the other side of the border. But before that, I would like to share with you the map of uh, the ethnic demography uh, map of Syria, uh, which was updated in 2010. So the colors represent uh, every each each ethnicity in Syria. But we need to also keep in mind that this map has been changed a lot. Uh, due to the mass exodus of Syrians and internal displacement. So basically, before the war, uh, the uh, yellow on the map represents the largest group in the nation, i.e. the uh, Sunni Arabs, who practice Sunni Islam, the main branch of Islam, as you might all know. Uh, so northern Syria has a more or less similar structure, but there's one difference, of course, uh, in comparison to the rest of Syria in that uh, it is mostly populated by Arabs as well as Kurds. Uh, Kurds are represented by uh, uh, Khaki Green in the map. So uh, they are almost equal in proportion. They, they were equal in proportion, uh, but this has of course changed after the war. Uh, the, sorry, I am struggling to switch, okay. So the, the religious demography map is less colorful than the ethnic demography map, but it is more complicated, I would say, because 70% of these uh, Sunni Muslims uh, account for the majority of uh, people in the country, and the 16% are composed of other Muslim groups, including Alevis, Shi'is, and Durjis. And also uh, there are Levantines, the Christian uh, Arabic-speaking community, which make up 10% of uh, the population. And as you all know, the country is run uh, by uh, the Assad family in cooperation with Mahmoud family, uh, who are both Alevis uh, from the Western side of the country. So let's now get back to the main topic of the second section of my presentation. Uh, the map shows uh, the most recent situation in the North Syria now, the green uh, colored zones are safe zones created by uh, created after Turkish operations, military operations into the country. The yellow and amber uh, like color zones are uh, controlled by Partia Yektia Democrat, aka PYD, and Yekinia uh, Palestina Gel, uh, the military branch of the PYD. Uh, they are in control of in most of the yellow zones. Uh, and at some points, as you can see on the map, uh, the uh, Russian flags represent the areas where Russian forces patrol. Uh, and also on the left hand side of the map, there is Idlib, which is home to 3 million uh, Syrians, which sought refuge after the fall of Aleppo. And also uh, along this line, there are uh, Russian outposts. Uh, and on the regime side, there are Russian troops. And on the Idlib side, there are Turkish troops. Uh, just checking uh, that, that, that there are no you know, infiltrations. Uh, so uh, I would just like to uh, briefly uh, provide a recap on how uh, 
the PYD expanded its control uh, over the region. I mean, there are a couple of uh, reasons that might uh, need further explanation, but I will basically skip to the most important parts. Uh, in 2001, uh, when the chance occurred, uh, in 2011, uh, sorry, when the chance occurred, uh, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK, provided extensive support to the uh, YP, uh, YPG and PYD in the form of personal resources and expertise. Also, the YPG and PYD has been pragmatist in grabbing hold of any assistance it could uh, maintain cordial ties with the Syrian government since 2011 and forming a tactical alliance with the United States in 2014 and 2015. Uh, after uh, these actors boosted the expansion of PYD and YPG in northern Syria. Turkey decided uh, to conduct, to execute uh, several operations. Four of them are on the screen. As you can see, they were executed in different uh, periods. And I was in Achilles uh, throughout all these periods. And it was significant between 2016 and 2018 because we had uh, projectiles and missiles hitting Kilis. So it was also a safety issue for Turkey. Uh, so it had to seal off its border. Uh, so these areas, the green areas, are called as safe zones now. And these two images I took in Kilis. The first one on the left belongs uh, to my house. This is my house. It was hit by a missile in 2017. Uh, I had Syrian tenants. Luckily, no one died. There were some minor injuries but it created a big hole in the roof and uh, on the ground. And this is a student dormitory, uh, a missile hit on the wall. Luckily, again, no one died. But in other attacks, uh, some uh, 30 people died. Uh, so this was an issue of safety, uh, not only on the other side of the border, but just inside the border. And this is Aziz, only 15 kilometers away from Achilles, 300,000 refugees reside in this tiki uh, very small uh, uh, little houses. And also there are tents provided by IHA, uh, the uh, Insan Hakları ve Hürriyeti Derneği, which can be translated into uh, English as human rights and freedom uh, charity. Uh, so in the safe zones, the security is taken care of by free uh, Syrian army groups uh, equipped by Turkey, of course. Also, Turkey invests in schools, hospitals, uh, and other buildings that provide service to Syrians. And these are some of the images I have taken out in Aziz region. These schools were built by Turkey, and they are run uh, together with uh, local actors. And this building was re uh, regenerated. Uh, it was uh, heavily bombarded by uh, Russian jets, and it was later on renewed by the Turkish government. And it is a lovely, uh, you know, yellow Halep Alipo style uh, covering uh, on the outside of the building. So this is used as a municipality building now. And on the right hand side, if I, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it says Kardeshlik uh, Sınır Tanımaz, Brotherhood uh, doesn't uh, know any border. So this was right next to the building. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, so lastly, on the issue of return, uh, Murat Erdogan has done an extensive research uh, on this issue as well in, uh, within his barometers. So in 2020, uh, Syrians who said that they don't think of returning to Syria was 77%. And uh, Murat Hoca has not published his last barometer, uh, which covers 2021, but I listened to him in a presentation, and uh, this figure dropped down to 60% uh, almost. So people who said that they don't think of returning to Syria decreased. That means more people now want to return to Syria. And also this uh, figure is also very important uh, because uh, people who said that they might return if the war is over uh, increased in 2021 for, uh, from 16% to 26% almost, if, if I'm not mistaken by the numbers. So finally, I want to show you uh, this figure uh, from a project that we are now carrying out in Kilis. We conducted surveys with 
241 Syrian students, and we asked them if they plan to return to Syria. And those who said uh, definitely no was 29%, and who were not sure were around 23%. Uh, so it's almost half half. Uh, but more importantly, we carried out uh, some interviews with them, and we asked them uh, more questions, open-ended questions. And uh, it was obvious that the return discussions uh, really set on uh, Syrian students. So they think of return as a political matter uh, rather than an actual matter. So they believe that the economical and political situation of Turkey uh, has led to this discussion. And they are not happy with talking about this unless there is a real change in Syria. Uh, I mean, unless uh, the Assad regime is throned, dethroned. So uh, they believe only those people who want to return should be sent back to return. And this answer is very important because this means that they are, what they understand from return is not safe voluntary return. So they are kind of being forced to return. So that feeling and sense of young uh, Syrian students who have spent most of their life from secondary school to high school who don't know anything about Syria, they uh, don't feel like returning to uh, Syria any soon. And also they're not very happy with these discussions uh, because they believe this is very political and this is due to the deteriorating economy of the country. And they are kind of uh, feeling pushed to this decision. And also it is very important, finally, this is my final remark, uh, the return decision is a family decision. So it's not a personal decision. Whenever one person wants to return, they will think about their families uh, inside Turkey or on the other side of Syria. And also there is a great need for reconciliation because uh, in Syria, people who stay in Syria, they don't really think very positively about uh, Syrian migrants who sought refuge in different countries because they believe they you know, betrayed their country. So this is, this is one important issue that needs to be kept in mind. And this is all from me. I think I kind of... Uh, exceeded my time one minute but i hope yeah. you can excuse me <laughs> because i had a bit of technical issue all right okay. thank you very much indeed uh, ibrahim i would move immediately on to zainab with the second presentation we need to stop the, the red button red Hello, button. yeah if you stop sharing i can yeah, share mine uh, okay and are you able to see my screen as a full screen? Not yes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, and I'm Zeynep uh, from BIC. Uh, and I am happy that our presentations will be kind of complementing. Right now, I will be moving you a little to the macro level. And also to to discuss the, also the the experiences of those who who, who already returned uh, to northern Syria. The findings is based on to to both um, uh, based on to my own research in the last uh, four years, uh, just about the return, as well as some data collection with those returnees. Um, who used to live in northern Syria right now, and those who also re-migrated back to the Turkey. I will come to this point. But let's start with the, some, you know, the numbers and what are the, you know, the, the size of the population we are talking about when we talk about the returns to the Syria. Actually, the numbers of the <laughs> returnees are very contested. And it is very normal that in the refugee studies, we know that it's almost impossible to know the exact number of the refugees. And for returnees, this is much, much difficult. And um, UN is very, very recently, in the just last weeks, it mentioned one officer from, for, from UN mentioned that around you know, the 800 Syrian refugees are leaving to Turkey each week. While the numbers, according to the Turkish government, specifically the Ministry of the Interior, the numbers um, from Turkey to northern Syria uh, since the 2016 is in half million. But unfortunately, we don't know where does number comes from. 
I mean, uh, I was checking to the, you know, the, the official web page since the 2016, actually, but there is not that much, you know, the exact numbers about the returnees, uh, but this is the number right now we have, you know, the half million, specifically the, the areas under the control, under the control of the, under the control of the Turkey control after the Turkish operations, which um, Ibrahim Ojem has already, you know, mentioned these four operations starting from the, you know, the 2016. And the policy goal is that the one million, probably you will remember that Pres President Erdogan mentioned that the idea is to, you know, the returning to the voluntary return of the one million. Actually, this number is not new. In two, three years ago in the UN um, meeting in New York, President Erdogan also mentioned this 1 million and also saying that if you give uh, more uh, funding and it will maybe up to the, you know, the 2 millions. And the UNSCR is, is, the, is supposed to be the main stakeholder in this all this return and the repatriation discussion. And uh, some numbers are also coming from the UNSCR, but it doesn't necessarily differentiate it by country. Only we have this uh, number around 300,000 uh, for all returnees. It includes the returns from Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Turkey. It doesn't necessarily differentiate among to the hosting countries of the Syrians. But we know that uh, from the previous data that the majority of these returns are from Turkey. And, uh, and in, a, in a very general sense, I will <laughs> I summarize what is, is the stance of the international community about the Syrian returns to the Syria which I call as an international disengagement. International community is not that much, you know, giving an attention to these returns, the spontaneous returns or the returns planning. And uh, as I said, UNSCS is supposed to be, you know, the main monitoring organization, but there is only two policy paper of the UNSCR right now published in 2018 and 2019 about these what can be the protection thresholds for possible return operations. Uh, on the other side, we see that the regional, the, the regional countries, because my research is not only about Turkey, but I also, you know, spend quite a lot of time to, to, the, uh, to work on Jordan and the Lebanon, and right now also the northern Syria, northern Iraq. And we see that the countries are trying their own ways and their own unilateralism. And among these hosting countries, Turkey is very, you know, the very distinct example uh, showing it is, you know, the unilateralism. And also return is uh, appearing as in a very strong policy narrative since the 2018. It's a highly politicized topic, both in domestic politics of Turkey and also in its geopolitics. In one recent article, I am explaining how it is an geopolitical issue and how it is related to the Turkey's, you know, the ideas and space making about the northern Syrian and in Middle East in general. But then currently, specifically after the 2019 local election in Istanbul, we see that uh, these return topics is a very much on the, at the very center of the domestic political discussion, specifically at the time of the elections. And uh, um, <laughs> geopolitically, we see an issue linkages, as, as my colleague mentioned about, you know, the Turkey's border security and um, it is national security is very much tied to the, you know, the security and the, the happenings in uh, Syria, specifically in northern Syria. And the repatriation and the fight against terrorism is often, you know, the mentioned in the same policy documents and the National Security Council decisions. Uh, although Syrians are not criminalized for terrorism, but we see that, you know, Turkey is putting these two objectives side by side, returning of Syrians and fight against, you know, the, uh, the, the terrorism on, on border security. And, but here we have it in a little different, you know, the picture in Turkey as well, that the government who has a very, you know, the um, Syrian refugee friendly policy for a long time, and it continues with this, uh, pattern, although some, you know, there are many restrictiveness on the way, and it shows a little more humanitarian paternalism, which I'm calling in this way, because even talking about the returns, it is mentioning that it should be in a voluntary, it should be, you know, the dignified manner, and our Syrian brothers and sisters should go back to their homes. But at the same time, we have in a very strong right now in a political discourse of the opposition parties, 
which is kind of you know scapegoating to the Syrians for the, all the problems is right now in Turkey, like an inflation, unemployment, high prices in rents, and etc. So both government and the opposition parties seems that they feel need to do something right now, specifically in this election time, to gain to the gain, gain votes. Because my colleague right now mentioned that yes, the aspirations of for Syrians for return is low, and when you look at the same barometer, it seems that you know the more than eight, 89% of the Syrians don't want to return in the next one year. On the other side of the coin, the, when you look at the Turkish public opinion, it says that 80% of the Turkish population wants the Syrians to return or Syrians sent back to the safe zone. So there's this dilemma that you know the Syrians don't want to return and they don't feel it's safe to return. On the other side, the public attitude is very strong, want to see the return and putting to the, you know, the parties in a way that they need to, they need to feel that they need to do something, specifically in the election times. And my colleague mentioned about you know, these um, some practices in the northern Syria and these housing projects for the returnees. In, in the in the regions under Turkey's uh, military operations. And right now we see more details about these housing projects, how how much for how big it will be and what will be the conditions. And uh, the Turkish government is, is really working about it, you know the, these details uh, and, and also the conditions to giving these housings to the returnees. And the funding is expected from international donors and civil society and internal donors. And OFAD seems to coordinating this housing and infrastructure, um, some of the infrastructure building. My colleague mentioned that there is, you know, that is opening of the hospitals, schools, religious services, and transportation, and the direct involvement in local administration in northern Syria. And, and also in the last um, months, we see more, you know, therefore for the job creation or emphasis on agriculture in the northern Syria to start the life once again. Uh, also internally in several publications, I mentioned that the Turkey is also using some techniques uh, to encourage or coerce returns to returns. And uh, we see some municipal level campaigns in where the Syrians are living in high numbers like Esenyurt in Istanbul uh, for, for facilitating returns or providing uh, logistics for returns. And I see specific in the border regions that you know the, some community leaders are trying to be convinced for returning in groups. And my colleague mentioned that you know the return is in a family decision, and also return is as a community decision. And one day, you know, the one tribe leader or community leader of the Syrians decided that they want to return, and uh, this is this can be an uh, end up with uh, returning in a large numbers. And uh, we see that the Syrians NGOs, some, some Syrian NGOs uh, having some, you know, the campaigns about the return and restructuring to the um, Syrian uh, infrastructure. Uh, these are a kind of, you know, the, let's say encouragement methods, but at the same time, there are coercive methods like restricting or delaying the registrations of the Syrians, restricting, you know, the mobility of the Syrians within Turkey and the strict control over informal working of the Syrians, which is the main livelihood opportunity for many Syrians. And, uh, and um, also the new policy, which is called Seyrat, doesn't allow to Syrians to be in one neighborhood more than 20%, specifically in cities like Antalya or Istanbul, in metropolitan cities. At the same time, there are these, you know, the, the, the problems about the um, legislative and administrative practices in which we heard a lot about uh, some Syrians, specifically male Syrians, if they encountered with police for any reason, they are forced to sign these voluntary return forms, which requiring them to return and look like an, a kind of, you know, the deportation, all the numbers are uh, few uh, in these cases. So why do Syrians return? And our research shows that, you know, that there are, I don't like this pushing and the pulling factor, you know, the dichotomy, but just for, you know, the ethical reason here, I, you know, that I want to mention. And there are some, you know, the reasons pushing Syrians to return, those who are 
spontaneously returning. And the, at the top of the, you know, the, the, the responses we got, mm -hmm. it seems that the economic difficulties in Turkey, specifically after the COVID and the losing to the informal job opportunities and the uh, high rents um, made some serious to decide to return. And uh, in, it was in the, just after the COVID, but in these years' um, interviews, we see that there are returns due to the growing hostility in Turkey towards to the Syrians. And some Syrians just return. They are saying that we cannot anymore, you know, the uh, anymore live with this hostility of the Turks against us because they don't want us, and we decided to return. Uh, and also the another reason looks like that some, you know, the some are returning because they lo lost their hope and prospects for onward migration to Europe. They tried for a couple of times, they were cheated by the smugglers, and then they decided, okay, there's no way, and the Turkey is not that much conducive right now, just return to Syria, at least it is our own country. If we die here, we will be dying here instead of on the way to the Europe. Also, we see this problem about integration pro integration challenges and the cultural factors and not using to the Turkish language is a one reason of returning. And the last is these legal challenges, lack of registration or lacking of working payment or involving in any problem with the police and accusing of having linked with terror or threat to the public safety or public order, which is very loosely defined in Turkey. On the other side, there is a pooling factors, right? And there is also, uh, there are also, you know, the, some reasons making them, you know, to, to decide to turn due to the family obligations, specifically taking care of the elderly and the taking care of the land which they left behind. And the belief that the security and the stability seems one reason and the desire to contribute to the reconstruction of the Syria it seems is a one reason, specifically if those people have some job opportunities over there. Uh, and as I said, the, the claim ownership of the land or housing is a reason, seems is a reason to, to uh, convincing people to return. So in the last two you know, the slides, I will mention about you know, the experiences of return returnees and what happens to the, these returnees when they return back and the main problem seems that you know the many almost all of them mentioned about this lack of livelihood opportunities and a high inflation in syria even if they uh, started up their own businesses but they were complaining about these inflation rates and the supply chain problems which they decided they cannot you know the live anymore Educational infrastructure seems another problem for those specifically having children. And they are saying, okay, there are schools, but there's no enough teachers. Water, sanitation, and electricity seems in one challenge, uh, specifically because in the one part of our studies is looking at the returns from Northern Iraq to Syria under PYD control or under the, the, the control of the Turkey. And they have mentioning those returning from Northern Iraq Northern Iraq mentioning about this water problem more than uh, others, and also housing, land, and property rights. For those in the Turkish part, they don't that much complain about housing, land, property rights issues, but those who are in the, especially the Kurdish populations, are they are uh, complaining about, you know, the losing to access to their own lands or losing to access to their own uh, housing, which is another problem, and the safety issues. But the one striking, you know, the observation is that even though people are returning spontaneously, voluntarily or non-voluntarily, there is this pattern of their re-entering re or re-migrating to Turkey back, even in a year. Even in a year, you see that some of these people are returning back with the help of the smugglers, and they are paying a lot to the smugglers to return. And those remigrating to Turkey once back, they are very decisive to stay in Turkey. They are saying that it's impossible to live in Syria. And some have getting their cards back, some does, don't have. And these remigration reasons include, as I said, these challenges in reintegration. So in a very last slide, I want to, you know, to increase this attention. We are talking about the Syrians, but I think that right now the problem 
not just about the Syrians, but the more, you know, the issues is right now to the deportation of the Afghans. In the last six months, Turkey is a very much, you know, putting an attention to the deportation of Afghans and the, and the numbers are kind of, you know, the around to the, you know, the right now the more than, um, more than uh, uh, 48,000. And these are irregular migrants in Turkey. We have a pilot study in Afghanistan. It seems that even though many are sent back to Afghanistan, but it is not a deterrence because the conditions in Afghanistan is, is very, very hard. And many of these returnees are planning to re-migrate. And this is where I want to, you know, to, to stop. Um, yeah, so sorry if I extend my time. Thank you very much, uh, Zainab. I would now uh, move on to invite uh, Zinam Ada to uh, provide uh, her comment on these two presentations. And then uh, we open uh, the session to the audience for comments and questions. So Zinam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Frank, for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Zeynep and Ibrahim, for these wonderful um, and insightful presentations. I was asked to um, contextualize um, the discussion, and I'm going to do that. Basically, what I want to do in the in the coming five minutes is, in a way, to kind of invite all of us, all of you, to um, think of the um, um, the issue of return from a kind of a foreign policy perspective, in the sense that. Um, I would argue that um, the, both the discourse, but also the practices around the return of Syrian refugees back to northern Syria demonstrate both the ambitions, but also the limitations of Turkish foreign policy, which has in the last five to six years, if not even more, become intrinsically intertwined with domestic policy. And when I say this, I do not only mean um, electoral concerns, I also mean uh, mechanisms and patterns of rent seeking and rent distribution. Um, now, I, I have uh, one, two, three, four points to make. I'll start with the first point will be about the safe zone, the discourse about the safe zones. I mean, although we hear about the safe zones more vividly and more um, frequently in the last, um, since the uh, the incursion actually in into April in 2018, Turkey has actually been pushing for the creation of a safe zone in northern Syria almost since the beginning of the Syrian civil war. But the reasons um, for which it was pushing for the formation of a safe zone changed significantly over the course of the last 10 years. Until 2014-15, the discourse was mostly around uh, the discourse about formation of a safe zone was mostly about creating basically the safe zone, creating the safe zone for the Syrian opposition, uh, alongside with basically Turkey's opposition against Assad regime in, in Syria. Now, with the war against ISIS in Syria and the international call, uh, the US led international coalition's um, um, uh, alignment with the YPG PYD, Turkey's ambitions. Or and objectives behind the creation of safe zones significantly changed um, uh, in northern Syria. Now, Turkey's military incursions between 2016 and 2020, there were four military incursions. Uh, three goals kind of motivated these incursions. First was, as my colleagues um, um, mentioned in detail, has been the repatriation of Syrian refugees who currently live in Turkey to the, 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 the basically safe zones, which are under the control of Turkey affiliated groups, different groups. This could be Free Syrian Army in, uh, in the Aleppo and its surrounding regions in the area between Tel Aviv and Ras Al Ain in the east of the Euphrates in Afrin, as well as uh, the Hayat Tahrir al-Sham al in Idlib, which is basically an, kind of um, a, a group that Turkey partners with in, in, in Idlib. Now, in addition to repatriation of refugees, of course, another significant aim of Turkey has been the prevention of an autonomous rule by the PYD YPG in northern Syria. And I think one should think of this um, in connection with the Turkish military operations that have been taking place in northern Iraq, but also 
um, the, 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 the violent conflict, armed conflict between the Turkish army and the PKK that has a history of 40 decades. So if you will, um, both the American invasion of Iraq in 2003, but then the Syrian war transnationalized the Kurdish conflict in Turkey, and um, as a result of also other factors, prevention of an autonomous Kurdish rule in northern Syria became one of the objectives of Turkish military incursions since 2016. And last but not least, um, these incursions were also justified with the motivation that Turkey doesn't want or try, is trying to stop another wave of migration from Idlib to Turkey and through Turkey to Europe. Uh, and that was basically kind of the one of the main motivations of the military operation in uh, February 2020 in, 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 in Idlib. Now, um, and all of these operations, uh, I think one should emphasize that very strongly, overlap with the um, change in Turkish foreign policy uh, or the, 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 the change in Turkish foreign policy since uh, 2016. Ibrahim Bey mentioned uh, about this, that Turkey kind of, in a way this can be good, kind of is pulling the, pulling basically um, kind of needs to take care of its own security concerns. So that was one of the main um, security narratives that drove the, these operations as well. Now, the third and the fourth point will be about um, kind of um, in a way to invite us to, 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 to um, think about the sustainability of this militarized approach to, to, to Northern Syria. And within that context, the sustainability of the, not only the narrative, but also the kind of the policies that um, uh, constantly put the emphasis on the on the return of the Syrian refugees. And there, um, I first want to briefly mention about the situation on the ground from a more, again, uh, kind of the geopolitical military point of view in northern Syria. At the moment, it's a very volatile status quo. Uh, there are different zones of uh, influence where foreign powers are involved. Turkey is one of them in cooperation with, with local actors. A low level conflict, violent conflict continues on the ground. Um, and in the, when it comes to the Turkey uh, controlled areas, again, in Aleppo, in uh, Afrin, and in the area between uh, Talabiyat and uh, Ras Al Ain in the east of Euphrates, um, uh, uh, Zeynep Hanım already mentioned that, that lack, lack of livelihood opportunities and of course both the inflation in Syria but also the economic situation in Turkey makes it worse by the day in the sense that I think one should basically here emphasize that Turkish lira is widely used in these areas. So in a way, one can think of these areas as in a way de facto Turkey administered areas. Um, under Turkish control. So the deteriorating economic situation in Turkey makes the humanitarian situation on the ground worse. And last but not least, of course, the um, war in Ukraine adds another layer of difficulty um, uh, and adds insult to the injury in, this, in two senses. First is the humanitarian, it makes the humanitarian crisis on the ground worse. And of course, I'm sure most of you know that today the UN Security Council is voting on the extension of the Syrian cross-border aid, which basically benefits uh, two and a half million people living in northwestern Syria. And if Russia veto is it, then the situation will become worse and so on. And of course, the one uh, indication or repercussion of the war in possible repercussion of the war in Ukraine in northern Syria might also be the kind of like the change of this volatile status quo on the ground. Um, mainly because of the kind of increasing uh, hostilities between the US and Russia. And also one should, I think, add to this, the talk about a possible new operation by Turkey, which is feared by among the expert community that it would kind of like um, this, disrupt this volatile status quo on the ground. Now, this is kind of like the, 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 the situation on the ground in Northern Syria, which I think should be taught as kind of a limiting factor of Turkey's foreign policy ambitions and relatedly the repatriation of Syrian refugees back to northern Syria. When we come to the Turkish side of the story, I think Zeynep mentioned um, explained it in detail, so I'm not going to basically repeat what she said, but I just want to um, um, basically mention that um, three points. First is the 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 um, 
um, discomfort within the Turkish population for different reasons. One can name cultural grievances, one can name economic grievances, one can name political grievances against the Syrian refugees have been rising and the ways in which the Turk political parties, both the, uh, the governing parties, but also the opposition parties deal with it, I think kind of add fuel uh, to an already inside uh, like flamed situation in the sense that the migration and refugees and migration have become important um, 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 kind of a fault line within the Turkish society and an important uh, uh, um, again, fault line within Turkish politics in the last... Sin Sinem, may I interrupt you here because we are well yes. over five minutes. Okay, okay. Yes. I had two questions Can though. Can I ask my questions to the... Um, to the participants or yes, shall I make? Yes, please. Yeah. And um, one so one question to both of them is that um, what do you expect would happen when it comes to this discourse about repatriating refugees if there is a government change in the coming elections in Turkey in 2023? And another question to Ibrahim Efe. Um, it, as you were presenting, I was wondering because now technically one can argue that the Turkish Syria border is de facto pushed 30 kilometers deep into Syria, right? So, and it's kind of um, so, what does it mean for the uh, for both the economy but also livelihood uh, in the border cities in Turkey? Uh, how does the like basically whether has uh, has the border economy changed? And again, what does it mean for both uh, 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 Turkey and Syria? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sinem. Uh, 